Lancashire, na na na. Hello, welcome to Love Rugby League Weekly here from Love Rugby League HQ in Warrington in association with our sponsors, Betfred. My name is Dave Parkinson, back from Serbia, mm. joined by James Messenger, back from Blackpool. Uh -huh. um, sadly, our trepid, you know, intrepid Barcelona duo can't be with us today. But uh, I'm sure that they'd be uh, going on about that forever and a day, won't they? Oh, they'd yeah, for sure. With, with tons and tons of, uh, it'd be a of stories. It'd be a three hour show, wouldn't it, if, it we would. had, if we had them on? Especially if James gets ranting. <laughs> we have completely different views of the whole <laughs> Barcelona experience. So, what can we look forward to in today's show? Well, we're going to be talking League One, we're going to be talking Championship and the Summer Bash, we're going to be talking what happened in Super League last weekend. And looking forward to Magic Weekend. And if we've got a little bit of time, I suppose you could chuck a couple of questions my way mm. about Serbia and the amateur game as well. Definitely. You'll notice I'm not in regular get-up, so James has uh, adhered to uh, Love Rugby League rules. <laughs> um, I've not, but uh, I thought, well, having been on tour, mm. let, let's go with it, You've let's run to. with it. Um, what else has been appearing on site in oh, my absence? We've had we've had all sorts, obviously, because we've been we've been all over recently. We've had the stuff from Serbia coming on. We've had match reports, post match analysis, lots of stuff coming out of Bloomfield Road from the Summer Bash, and obviously all the all the content from Barcelona, which has been a uh, which has been brilliant. We've seen a lot of a lot of good articles on site. Some some picture galleries, which I think demonstrates just how big a, how big a day it was, how big a game it was. Saw a lot of uh, a lot of good pictures with all the Catalonia flags. I think that they were probably the highlight of the weekend for me. But yeah, we've had a lot. We've had obviously the usual stuff off the record, paper tour off the record. This week's quite interesting. We've had a bit of stuff around Anthony Gellin possibly swapping over to Warrington. So that's one to keep an eye on. Well, I mean, the interesting fact about that is that um, I think it was James himself who posted yesterday that um, the. Super League clubs are now withholding some of the academy monies back. Well, it's funny you should say that because the first comment we've had in here from Will Buckley, he's actually mentioned that straight away. Do you think it's fair that Witness have had their funding taken away? Um, I'll shoot from the hip with this one because yeah. it's bound to be a controversial view that I don't think we'll, we'll get. Um, they're a new club, so why should they be entitled to any monies that the old club was getting? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I tend to agree, agree with that as well. And obviously the... With this this new setup, they've got new people financing the club. They've obviously got got to find a way of safeguarding it as well and making sure that similar problems don't occur further down the line with the new company. I, I think for once, this is Super League clubs being quite prudent uh, in one way. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but maybe this maybe this what Winners are experiencing now yeah. is a wake up call and a reason why you get Drew sat on here sort of a fairly regular basis saying about oh, let's have reserves let's have academies yeah and it costs well then obviously we've seen a lot we've witnessed this year they've, they've been very keen since the administration to point out how good the academy has been we've seen so many players coming through their system over the last 12 18 24 months and i think a few of the games we've seen you've had back lines full of witness academy products and i, I get that yeah I get that you know and it's, uh, i'm not decrying that of course. I, but, but i i I just think that now this shows why so many teams outside of Super League can't and indeed don't run academy and, and reserve team structures because of those cost implications. Because let's be honest, if, if Widnes are going saying, QE, we want another 70 grand, where's our 70 grand? Yeah. If that's for half a year, that suggests that they've been getting 140 grand to fund that academy system, which exactly. to be honest, you need at least 100 grand to fund it and do it properly anyway. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens with Widnes going forward in terms of the academy stuff because... You look at the club in recent years and we've mentioned then about how, how successful the academy has been. That, that's arguably the biggest thing to do with Witness at the minute is their ability, even if they've not got the money to bring in players or retain players. We've seen the likes of Tangata, Liam Hood exit the club after the administration. It's one of the good things has been the fact that they've been able to bring through these young lads who haven't had a lot of first team experience before. We've seen the likes of Jaden Hatton, mm -hmm. Lloyd Roby, Callum O'Neill. We've all, we've all come onto the scene this year. And that, that's what Witness are doing really well at the minute. So it is going to be disappointing, but it'll be interesting to see where they go from here. It will, it will, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a big advocate, to be honest. And if, if you know, they're not going, if the money isn't available in the pro game, mm. should professional clubs be aligning themselves with amateur clubs and actually paying the amateur clubs yeah. to do the development work for them? Because ultimately, 
you probably get the best development more bang for your buck, don't you, through yeah. the amateur game itself. Who, not, at the moment, the, the, they don't get any funding. Exactly. They've got to find their own money. And obviously we're seeing in the Championship and League One especially, we're seeing a lot of players being brought in from amateur clubs. I think mm. at Rochdale in particular, since Matt Callan's taken over, I was looking this morning, they brought in eight players and a lot of them have been from academy clubs. We've had Gleeson coming in, who's been a very good player, Worthington, all, from all across the amateur scene. And that, that's where... A lot of the good players are developed, and then the, a lot. There's probably a lot more that we've not even seen that are waiting for that chance to step up. But it's nice to see a lot of more amateur players getting their shot at part time and full time rugby league, and that 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 that's a really pleasing thing. It shows that amateur rugby league is is growing and it is flourishing. Well, I'll I'll be honest. You know, having been on tour last week with uh, eighteen great lads, <laughs> um, you know, there's some of them that deserve a shot at the professional ranks, and I certainly hope that they they get it and. Uh, there's rumours one or two could be heading to a club uh, not far from here mm. in uh, the next few weeks. So I'm just awaiting the call that I can actually talk about <laughs> it a bit more. Uh, but yeah, that, that should be pretty good. Um, so, so yeah, so it is an interesting point. Thank you very much for raising that. Have we, anybody else uh, said anything? Oh, about David Taylor getting touched. Hiya, there. Dave, you all right? Saying, what's going on at Keithley, Dave? What's going on at Keithley? Well... I was gonna. We were gonna start with League One anyway, so we might as well hit with with the Keith Lacugas. Um I'll be honest; it's a curious one, isn't it? Because mm. um, Craig Lingard's been in there. He, he's overseen all these issues. He's managed to get a, a squad back out on the field this season, hold it all together while all the ownership was being sorted out at that club. Um, he's got so far into the season. And, and suddenly he's not there anymore. Well, I think it, it's an interesting one, but then you, you look at it and you can kind of understand why it's happened because there's been, there's been no question in Keith Lee financially have had a lot of issues recently, especially. Mm. And you, you get the feeling that the manager or the head coach or whatever the title is, whether if they're looking at extending contracts, he'd obviously be keen to extend, extend his stay. And I think it might have come down to the fact of saying we can't afford to give you better terms than your own perhaps which possibly which quite which quite possibly could happen for a club like that and yeah, if, if you're a coach who's done very well as he has done recently and then you're told that they're not going to extend your contract then it's almost a case of right well is there much point me sticking around here because i'm not gonna not gonna be here for the long term so i'm get out get out now while i can and then see what see what the future holds for me is this where it's been quite similar to halifax that, that seems to have been the general gist i mean i i don't know through um, you know, not speaking to Richard Marshall personally about yeah. it, but it, is that the similar sort of gist? That that feels like that. Yeah, what's you, there you, as well, doesn't it? Yeah, you, they've wanted to discuss sort of the future and not been able to come, agree terms. Or yeah, you get the feeling, especially when it's a successful coach, as as you've had, as you've just pointed out with Richard Marshall, you've got you've got a coach who's been winning, who's been overachieving, possibly with given the the funding, given the players, the resources he's had, and then as a coach, you're you're thinking if you've done a good job, then the next step is to get improved terms. And if, if a club can't afford that, then coaches are well within the right to, to depart the club. And I think that's what we're seeing twice already this season. I bet you're a happy man anyway, because uh, not, not speaking about people losing their jobs and stuff, but you've been extolling the virtues of Chester Butler uh -huh. every time we've mentioned Halifax on this show. And he's gone and been picked up by Huddersfield, hasn't he? I know, I was very pleased when I saw that, because I've, I've seen him quite a few times this season. He's, he's a fantastic player, even when... I saw him last season when it's been the, the middle eight qualifiers and whenever whenever I've seen him play, he's played a couple of times at Warrington and he's, he's always been the player on the Halifax team that I look mm. at and think this, this, this lad could do something special. Obviously, you've got players like Scott Morell in the halves who they're an evergreen player. They've been there, done that, really big game players. But then I think out of, out of the crop of exciting players that they have at Halifax, I thought Butler would be the one to make the step up. And um, I think Huddersfield are a... Uh, Huddersfield have got a good player there, and in terms of how he fits into their squad, he, he said he's uh, he's looking forward to moving full time. You get the feeling if if he's if he's this good when he's part time, then it's scary how how exciting he could be. You've seen players move from part time up to full time, like to Joe Bullock as another example, and it's crazy when they've given that full time environment to train, to develop the skills, to to bulk up a little bit and hone the craft a lot more. You could already say the same for uh, Daryl Alfords as well. Exactly. Or Salford, who's done done pretty good since he's going there. Exactly. Well, that that's what you see. If, if players are if players are getting the opportunity to hone the craft in a full time environment, they're obviously going to step up the game. And we're seeing a lot more now players who are making that jump and are being really successful at it. 
I think it's also cheaper than trying to scour Australia as well to bring in some second rate, never known Australia. Wait, wait, yeah, exactly that, that. That's exactly the point. And I'm saying like Gary Schofield there, right? So <laughs> I actually don't have anything against Australians, by the way, just in case we've got any antipathies <laughs> watching. But then you've got you've got Chester Butler. I, I think he, in the long run, if they, they give him the coaching, they're giving the the resources, the help, and the environment he needs to develop. I think he could be far more far more effective and far more efficient in Super League than a second rate overseas player coming to the end of his career ever could and it, I'll be interested to see what, what happens with Butler now we wish him all the best at Huddersfield and it's it just exciting times for him as an individual uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Halifax when we come to do our, our sort of round up uh, yeah. regarding the summer bash but I want to get back to, to League One because we've got a big match happening this weekend there's yeah. one match in particular Saturday evening um, in my opinion it's the biggest one of the season so far at that level Whitehaven meet London Scholars if you'd said to me before the start of the season, would London Scholars so far into the year be sitting pretty in second, <laughs> level on points with Whitehaven on top, I would have been asking what drink you were having. I know. Um, but they've done tremendously well of London Scholars. Um, they've warmed up for this, by the way, Scholars, with a 22-6 success over Doncaster, who did so well last season. Uh, Doncaster, of course, also catching the headlines in the last few days with uh, revealing Rangi Chase's back. Mm. Um, yet another opportunity for him to maybe lay his demons behind him. I hope he I hope he's taking I hope he gets to take this opportunity. De- definitely. He's had two or three now, hasn't he? It's a last chance saloon you get the feeling for him at his age now. Um looking at the scholars though, they've got some impressive performers. They've got the likes of Joe Brown who's coming from Wigan, um previously at Bradford. Good outside back. I saw him play a bit at Swinton last season. Strong player. They've got Ilias McCarney as well who's run the wing at the Broncos. He's been at Bradford and Sheffield over recent winger. years. Uh, they've also got Richard Wilkinson as well, who's been running half back for them this year. Yeah. Who I think they brought in, strangely enough, from Doncaster in pre season. Um, he's a good player. I was surprised when Doncaster didn't renew his contract, in all honesty. They've also got Neil Thorman as well, who's now reaching the veteran stage of his career. <laughs> I think I've seen Neil play right across the back line, both half back positions and loose forward. He's now settled in at hooker. So he's, he's gone everywhere. He is, so mate, so, but he's controlling things. Good goal kicker as well. And recently, they've also been able to call on the likes of Dan Hindmarsh from the London Broncos on Jewel Reg. Uh, John Magreen's gone back there, mm. um, who was a big player for London Broncos. And they've got that massive uh, Lamont Bryan as well, who had a, a little stint with Featherston earlier on his career. So yeah. those are the guys I think to look out for this weekend. Maybe they'll even get on the score sheet as well. Whitehaven conversely, they enjoyed a 28-14 success over North Wales. And for me, the players to look out for there, the two centres, Jason Mossop, who's one of the nicest guys in rugby league, I spoke with him earlier in the year. Uh, Jesse Joe Parker, who's shown some, some, some great loyalty there. Papua New Guinea player, of course. I think he's been there about six or seven years now. Um, tremendous centre at that level. They've got Chris Taylor, who came through the ranks at Wigan, who's now playing at fullback. Sam Dowsett, former Askin player, who's stepped up this season for a second chance at the professional game. Yeah. Grabbed it with both hands. Had a brilliant game last week by all accounts. And they've got some real experience, the likes of Mark Shackley, Chris Coward, big grafters, big Cumbrian grafters, yeah. uh, who I think are also good good guys. And recently they signed Carl Forster, who was the player yeah. coach last season. It must be but a weird situation for him, wasn't it? It must feel a bit strange, that, mustn't it? You know, but maybe in a way it possibly helps because he, he doesn't have to think about anything else but his own game well, he's, only, he's only what 26 as well yeah, isn't right? yeah. so it's, it's, it's not even like he's entering the twilight of his career he's, he's still a very young guy who's got got a lot to learn and he, he's maybe he'll he'll enjoy as you said he'll enjoy just, just focusing on the rugby and not having to worry about anything else I think that's a, probably a good move for him it's definitely going to refresh him isn't it yeah. you know, for when the next management opportunity comes up for him definitely. him indeed he wants to step back into the fire shall we say <laughs> uh, they've also got Jacob Moore there as well who I saw a bit at Workington last season and uh, he's again a similar sort of second row grafter like I've mentioned with the other players but he's took on the additional juice of goal kicking this season and done it really well so I think that that's going to be a, a really good game also the other results that happened in uh, League One last week there was a good win for Newcastle Thunder 40 points to 12 over Keith Lecugas Oldham uh, jumped back on the horse with a 34-18 success against Coventry and recent news as Oldham entering a dual reg agreement with Lee of all people so mm. um, that could, could work out obviously coached by two very local people yeah 
Um, like so, well, there's a bit of success there. And Workington, they edged out Hunslet 12 points to four. And another little bit of amateur news from that is that Workington's recently taken Russ Bolton on trial. Now, he's a guy that's played for Cumbria in the trying series at the end of the Barla season yeah. for the last few years. But he's been one of the top players at Ascombe as well. So like Dowsett before, he's yeah. now grabbing his opportunity with both hands in the pro ranks. So, oh, good stuff. So that's good. Um, shall we move on to the uh, Summer Bash? Now, summer bash, you yes. saw far more of this than I did. Yeah. So I'm just going to run through the run through the scores. Yeah. Uh, and you feel free to tell me what you think. Yeah. We'll be it a team of the tournament or whatever. For sure. Um, so... The round 14 of championship, it was the Summer Bash in Blackpool. Barrow Raiders 18, Sheffield Eagles 30, Batley Bulldogs 30, Dewsbury Rams 14, Bradford Bulls 14, Halifax 21, Featherstone Rovers 42, York City Knights 10, Lee Centurions 36, Witness Vikings 22, Rochdale Hornets 30, Swinton Lions 40, and Toronto Wolfpack 42, Toulouse Olympic 14. There was, there was some some very high scoring games as as we're seeing some very exciting ones. There was. Did some of them have? Uh, did he take the tackle shield with them? I think I think yeah. Some of some of the tackling was was quite poor from some of the teams. But then at the same time, that's not to discredit the amount of the amount of good attacking play we had. And what one of the teams that I spoke about I spoke about over the weekend with a variety of our content that we put out on Motherleague.com was Featherstone. Featherstone's win against York was absolutely. Superb. I've not I've not seen a side perform that well in a long time. I think since Dane Chisholm's gone in there, he seems to have really fired him up, doesn't he? He's, yeah. a, he's a real sparky player, a real interesting character. I mean, didn't he also reveal as well why he got the boot at Bradford that he ended up going to some sponsors stag do or something? Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 that's just bizarre. Isn't it's it? a weird situation. But you, I saw a tweet at the weekend. I can't remember who it was off, but he said. You, you wonder how good Bradford's halfbacks must be if they're able to let Dane Chisholm leave on a permanent basis. And you, you, you think and you look at Dane Chisholm, how he played. He, he was the star of the show. Out of every player at the, at the Summer Bash, I think he was head and shoulders above anyone else he performed there. He, he, had, he used class. He had composure at the right times. I think the two tries that York got were quite late on and it gave a little bit of gloss to the scoreline. But... Mm. You, you, you look at Featherstone, you, you wonder where they're weak now because now they've got Chisholm and Tom Holmes in the halves. They've got two players full of creativity and guile who, who are always looking to break the defensive line and they, they look to link up very well considering they've not had many games together. You look at the forward pack, they've got the likes of Scott Wielden who's obviously got Super League experience. And I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, but they've also got Dale Ferguson who's just yeah, come he's in. just joined them, hasn't so he? He's on loan from... Is it... Huddersfield. Huddersfield, yeah. So you, you look at you look at him coming in to bolster what's already a big forward pass. There's no there's no area that they're particularly weak. And even at, at, at Hooker, you've got Cameron King, who and and Aussie, who's been he's, he's been fantastic for them. He was another another real live wire. But yeah, you you don't really see a weakness with Featherstone this year. And we did say at the start of the season it would depend how all the halfbacks gel, and it's took them probably a third to halfway through the season. To actually now settle on a pair of halfbacks, they yeah. tried numerous combinations. Well, they? Obviously, the had was it Asse Boaz, they had yeah. Watson Boaz, and they tried all kinds of combinations. I remember seeing them earlier in the season when they came to Witness, and the they, they got beat. I think it's forty two twenty two, and the the halfbacks was the area they were weak in. The, they were the, a bit clunky, weren't they? they? They were a bit clunky. They weren't. They didn't have the the ideas that the, the Boaz brothers in the halves. They were they were good players. They were sparky players. I actually dealt with a lot of PNG internationals. But they didn't seem to have that craft and that that big game experience that you need to maybe break into break through the line and set set tries up and inches and they've got someone who can do that. Before we move on, what type of halfback do you think Chisholm is? Is he is he more a schemer or is he more a runner? Because he seems to be able to do a bit of both, doesn't he? It? Yeah, it's it's hard to pin down. I'd probably say is 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 more of a is more of a runner. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, his his link up with with Holmes and his ability to. To shift the plays and set everything up was, was fantastic to see. Sometimes at championship level, you, you can get half bats who are the, the good with ball in hand, they're good at like jinking the way through the line, but then they've not they've not the full package, maybe not got the defence to back it up. Mm -hmm. not, the, there's sometimes there's something missing. That's some of that I saw with uh, Rochdale v Swinton. You've got the likes of Rob Fairclough and Dan Abram who are very good with ball in hand, but then you think 
with with a high score line like that, neither of them really had the game management, which is isn't discrediting them. They were both very excellent performances. And both fairly young as well. Yeah, I mean, they're both talking both, about two lads there who are what twenty one tops. 20, exactly. Yeah, there's the two young lads and they've got a long way to go. And that that's something that'll inevitably come with time. But you've got a lot of a lot of halfbacks who've got the skills but are the complete package. But I think in inches and they've got someone who is that complete package. You mentioned Dan Abram and every time I, I see that name mentioned anywhere I just feel totally old because <laughs> I remember years ago when his dad Darren was an academy coach at Leeds before he took a <laughs> big first team job. Yeah. Um and uh, Dan used to follow him around everywhere. <laughs> um and in fact like I, I remember the, the lads sort of looking after him a bit and him sitting on the back seat in the coach with them, you know, like <laughs> way back when. So every time I see him running around now as a 21, 22 year old, I'm thinking, geez, I, I'm old, mate. How time's flown. How time has flown. <laughs> um, any other performances get, yeah. can really catch your eye? Well, in, in, terms of, in terms of team performances, I was a little bit disappointed with Toulouse against Toronto, especially given early in the season, Toronto have been beaten 46 16 by the French side and then the T- Toulouse just didn't, they didn't get going at all. They, they were always on the back foot, back foot from minute minute one. They they couldn't get into the game. They, by the time that they found the rhythm in the second half, it was probably a bit too late because you'd already had Chase Stanley crossing for tries. You'd already had Josh McCrone, Joe Meller, Gareth O'Brien. That that trio was absolutely sensational in the in the spine of Toronto. They looked to be a lot more polished than I've seen this season. Now I know I've been incredibly critical on this show earlier on about Josh McCrum. So here's where, you know, you've got, a, it's a free hit, because obviously yeah. you're all saying that he's linked up really well. When I yeah. said he was useless, didn't I? I think those were my words. Yeah. Um, so this is your free hit back at me now. So tell me how he's improved. Oh yeah, he, well, exactly. He was he was absolutely fantastic. He, I think what what he did at the, the Summer Bash was he, he played up to I think the big the big atmosphere, the big game occasion. Sometimes he's maybe not shown it when he's got gone to a game like a barrow away, a ballet away. You know, the, the small, small stadiums maybe is is because obviously he's used to playing in from a thousand upon thousands in big stadiums and you get the feeling whether going to Bloomfield Road maybe brought out a little bit more of a spark in him, but <laughs> he was he was absolutely fantastic with ball and hand down and with his kicking as well. I think one one of his kicks through, I think, set up Joe Meller. Um, but yeah, he was he was absolutely scintillating, and you you think that 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 trio, in Mella, McCrone, O'Brien, they're good at they're good enough for Super League. It's, I mean, I, I agree with you with O'Brien. O'Brien yeah. is a fantastic player. Um, again, Whitney's fans are going to hate me because I have never truly rated Mella, oh. despite him being you know sort of maybe one of the top performers over over the last few years. I've always thought he's got a tendency to run himself round getting exhausted and not yeah. really coming up with too well, much think, off the back of it. Now, think, do you think combining with someone like McCrone, who's obviously very structured, yeah, that's maybe what gets the best out of Well, you look, you look at who Mel has played best with in his career, and arguably him and Kevin Brown mm. at Widnes was when he performed best. That's a fair point. You, you had Kevin Brown, who he was the orchestrator, he was the, the master-in-chief setting all the plays up, and Mel was the one who threw the pass to, to finish the plays off. And then you, you, you draw a comparison between that and how he's linking up with Josh McCrone, who again, although McCrone is a bit of a, fair, a flair player, he has got that structure, he has got that big game now so it's needed to, to get his side in the position to cross for the points. You look at Chase Stanley's hat-trick that he got and none of them were particularly hard finishes and that's testament to the to the good work that the mid the, the midfield and the, the creative players did did for him. The, the outside bats don't don't get a lot of touches at Toronto unless they're running the ball out. Mm. But when they, when they do get the ball, they're, they're devastating with it. Okay, okay. Um, are, are any of our comments? Yeah, we've had a, we've had a couple a couple talking about. Is the, anyone uh, having a go at me for my go at uh, Witness Academy? No, surprisingly not. Oh, yeah, okay, they they might flood in later, but we've had a, <laughs> we've had a couple of comments about um, about the Bradford Halifax game. Yeah. About there being lots of poor calls made by the referee. Obviously, when you how did you see it though? Did when, you see what was it? Was it were they there, poor calls or was couple, it more? Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't call them poor calls. So obviously, James Fairbank here said they got a try not given, which was hundred percent a try. They, they were touch and go decisions yeah. where it's a case of A, has he knocked it on close to the line when he's diving to score and B, is his foot in touch in the second half? Right. And I think it, it's Were hard. Were both to, right on balance? I think it's, it's touching. I think that the second, the one in the second half especially would possibly, I think the, the linesman might have got that wrong, keeping his flag down. But 
at the end of the day, it, it was a tough job in a tough, feisty Yorkshire derby. And I think on, on balance, the refereeing across the whole weekend was absolutely brilliant. You, without having video ref, you, you're going to get some calls, aren't you, that aren't aren't a hundred percent right it's it's a case of interpretation quite often with the referees and the linesmen at the end of the day for halifax the, the even though they had a try disallowed they, they still went on and won and it was still a very good performance was it also a case of maybe after the lord Mayor's show for uh, bradford because obviously they, have, they were on a real high last week the not leagues off the perch, not yeah. to make the Challenge Cup, continue their misery which i'm sure everyone in bradford is particularly happy about <laughs> at the moment um but you know, was it a case of them not being able to raise the game? Or yeah, well, or am I am I am I again discounting Halifax? No, too much though? I think it's a bit of both. I think Halifax on balance were, were the better team and they deserved to win. But I know I, I got a little bit of flack in some of my reporting at the weekend because I said possibly a cup hangover from Bradford. It, it's inevitable, isn't it, when you when you've had a game against your your, your biggest rivals, a league above on. And they've taken a scalp like they have in the cup. Mm. It's going to be hard to, to follow that up straight after with yet another big performance in the summer bash, which is equally a big competition and a big big occasion. I, I think that there was a little bit of tiredness in that Bradford team. Not everyone will agree with me. Obviously, Bradford fans or Halifax fans will be quick to point out that Halifax were the better team, which I'm, I'm not going to discount. But yeah. I, think, I think Bradford did did show a little bit of fatigue, especially towards the end. Well, I'm going to flip it now because I'm going to say, right, Put put your Halifax hat on. Yeah. Suits you as well. Oh, there we suits, go. You, suits you. Um, and who who stood out for them? And te- take away Morel because he's always there. There about. But you yeah. know, was there anybody else that saw particularly well, it, for it? It was weird with Halifax because there weren't there weren't many who really stood out as collective. individuals as a collective. They, they, yeah. they were a, they were very good team performance. I think that's yeah, some, okay. sometimes when we like a lot of players who will come to talk about in a minute. There's a couple more I want to mention who perform well as individuals but quite often you don't you don't see the wider team performance and I think with Morel as you've mentioned orchestrating it down the middle I think the, the team the teams have clicked into gear obviously they're playing well under Simon Griggs who's now who's now been given the, the job on a on a permanent basis which is absolutely fantastic. He's had a great run there hasn't he? Is it four wins on the trot? Four wins on the trot he's now got a contract I believe until the end of 2021 but yeah it's a it's an interesting one I think I think they they were probably the team performance of the weekend, and then all the other all the other victories quite often were to do with individuals. Obviously, Featherstone would be up there for team of the weekend. Yeah. But I think out out of those two, I think Halifax had just nicked that. But going back to individuals, that I thought were impressive. Just a quick mention to Pat Moran, who played for Sheffield on loan from Warrington. He had to play some big minutes because I think there were a couple of nasty injuries for Sheffield. Kidding. He's a good yeah. kidding. Well, you, you look at the Warrington, you know how much strength and depth they've got in the forward pack. And I was quite interested to see Moran because I've not, I've not seen a great deal of him, especially since he's gone to Sheffield. He played 50, 60 minutes, I, I, I'd imagine, given the injuries that they had. And he, he was absolutely head and shoulders above anyone in that Sheffield team. He was absolutely sublime. And you wonder how long it'll be before he gets that, that shot in the Warrington team or whether... It's a case of him having to bide his time and wait until the end of the season. If there's people departing, that's when he might get his shot. Do you think he might be tempted to move on himself? Because I mean, he's been part of that first team set up at Warrington without pushing his way through fully yeah. for about the last three years, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I don't think he will move on just because I think I do see him having a big future at Warrington, especially. I can draw a comparison between him and Matt Davis. I know it's a bit of a different scenario, okay. but Matt Davis has come into Warrington and he's had to wait for his chance. But when he's got it, he's taken it. And now, it, it, it. And now he's, you saw when, when Warrington got beat by Hull FC at the weekend, which we'll come on to later, they were missing missing Matt Davis for that. And it's it's crazy how, how much of an influence someone can have on the team in such a short space of time. What do you think? I mean, you're, you're watching, you probably saw much more of the Summer Bash than I did, but being, being <laughs> out of the country, um, who stood out for you? Anybody in particular? Um, what about the Widnes and Lee game? Because there was one or two little incidents in that, some great tries scored, and uh, yeah. as as a Lee fan, first and foremost, I'm really happy they were able to turn the tables on what happened on Good Friday. Yeah, Lee were, Lee were, Lee were very good, they had a very good performance at a lot of players really clicked. Obviously, Ryan Bryder was was a standout for me. He had an absolutely superb game. He's quick, though. Yeah, he's got a lot more pace than a lot of players at championship well, one, level have. To be one honest. thing that I noticed as well was his his support play. Even when he's he's set moves in motion, but then he's always on hand on the inside to bag tries. I think he got, I think he, uh, I think he got two tries in the game, and 
they were both courtesy of being in the right place at the right time to support. I think in in terms of in terms of the league team, probably the wider league, he's the best in he's the best at doing that. He's the best at being on hand to help out his teammates. One one thing that I think Witness were a bit unlucky with was in the first half, Toby Adamson, who opened the scoring for Lee, he he was possibly lucky to stay on the pitch. A little bit of a cheap shot on Ted Chappell in the tackle, a little bit of an elbow in the face, whether that that whether there's any retrospective action comes from that, but because obviously the incident was placed on report. I was going to ask, did he get put on report? I'm not. I'm, he got put on report. I don't know if there's been any action taken from that. It, been, it usually is a week yeah. later. Whereas in Super League, it's like the following week. Yeah. In Championship, it's usually a week later. Yeah, I'd be very, I'd be very surprised because I think. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think I, I, I would be surprised if he gets if he gets away with it. I think he probably should get a ban. But at the end of the day, he was. It was, it was a little bit of a cheap shot, but nonetheless, Lee were deserving of the win. Uh, I'm not sure Andrew's showing. He said, the best <laughs> moments at the matches last weekend, Sean Ayn scores Soreen celebrations. <laughs> Brilliant. I mean, for starters, Rochdale Onyx were dressed like a Soreen packet, weren't they? Oh, yeah. The, I'm, I'm not sure whether... I think that kit's one of them that kind of splits opinion. I, personally, I, I, I quite liked it. I don't know why. It was psychedelia-inducing, <laughs> that kit. I saw a picture of it. I thought, God, you've actually played in that. Would have given me a migraine. Maybe that was the idea, to give the opposition a migraine so they, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't play. Yeah, possibly. Uh, it, was, it was crazy, but it was a big performance. I, I just wonder how many other players go onto the field with things hidden in the socks, though. Because so this is something that I think referees and touch judges... They're meant to check before you go out. Yeah. <laughs> How's he managed to sneak a sorry in bar out there? I know. I'm getting keep some free advertising on this show as well. So, you know, <laughs> sorry, we would love to have you on board. We love Rugby League. Do get in touch with Lucy. I know she's awaiting your call. <laughs> yeah, we just won't put ours in our socks. Yeah. No, no, we'll have them on the table. I just, I just <laughs> we can have those. Warm, and in fact, you know what that means? Mm. It'd mean we could go on for about three hours on a podcast, oh my post, gosh. as opposed to the hour that we always aim at and never quite hit. <laughs> uh, because you're always after your lunch, aren't you? Straight after yeah. you're always dashing down the road, aren't you? <laughs> straight um, off for some food. But yeah, I mean that. <laughs> I actually saw that bit. I thought, what's he doing? Reaching into his sock, and then suddenly he's opening. I actually thought he was miming something. <laughs> I didn't realise he was actually eating a sorry. It, was, it was it was peak Championship rugby that year. You won't get that in Super League. But I might be proven wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, something like Josh Charlie scores at the Magic Weekend and gets some chocolate bar out of his sock. You never know. I'll have to wait and see what happens, but you can't see it really. A final, a final note from the from the summer bash before we move on, though. Even though it wasn't a result, a, a great result for them. Barrow, um, Waltovo Parara Junior. I think pronouncing that right. He was he was very good. We were talking off camera before we started. So he's a hooker, isn't he? He's a hooker. Yeah. Papua New Guinea player. Yeah. So there were two PNG players in that team. There was him and Stargroth Amin. We both played at the weekend and I think it was crazy to see how many times I was writing down Walter over Puara Junior because he, he, he was in and around it for every minute that he was on the pitch. He was always he was always trying to keep the players going. He was your stereotypical, lively PNG international. Do you think he's better than the level that he's playing at? Yeah, I I, person, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he stepped up to Super League even though I think he's 28 well, years old. That's Is big it, praise. It, it's big a, praise. Yeah, but well, you look at one player who he reminded me of a little bit, obviously I'm I'm a Warrington fan, I've seen a lot of Warrington. He reminded me a little bit of Brad Dwyer in the fact that he's quick around the rook, he's 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 quite he's quite lively, he's not the biggest character, but he's got a lot of fight, a lot of determination. And I said it wouldn't surprise me if he stepped up because he looked like he has got all the attributes needed. Can he drop goals from forty metres as well? I'll we'll have to see if that comes out. Well, Leeds to be season. after him. Oh, you never know. Matt Parcel, Montova, Pereira Junior. <laughs> they fight for places there, won't they? And, and to be fair, by the time, I mean, as, as do, doing a little bit of commentary, I guess every time you've mentioned his name, he'd already have passed the ball, wouldn't he? It's, cra- it's crazy, yeah. It's all, the, all the commentary that I heard over the weekend, it was always him getting the ball two seconds later, the ball's already <laughs> out to the wing, because he, he is, he's got that sleight of hand, and not many players possess that. You've got a lot of good hooks in the Championship, but not many have that ability to have have a quick sidestep quick quick movement with passing but he, he, he appeared to be very good and we've, we've spoken a lot about teams losing players in Super League you look at a Salford a Wakefield perhaps who maybe over the off season they might lose a few players and these are the kind of guys if, if they're having to operate on a smaller budget players like Puara Junior are people that you could target because he's more than capable of doing something fair enough um Final thoughts. I mean, the crowds at the Summer Bash were what three thousand up on last year. Yeah, they were. I think 
it's 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 always hard to tell because you you look at the summer bash and you you always see all the empty seats. But then you got to remember, a lot of fans don't go for the full weekend, and the the size of the stadium. You've got you've got teams in one corner. You've got Halifax over there. You've got Featherston here. You've got York there. Witness Lee. They're all dotted about. I think it's it's positive. I think it's a step in the right direction, even though. It was only fifteen over the course of the weekend. Would you keep it at Blackpool, boy? Right? But I, you're talking, you're talking of like it's, it's a raise in, in attendance from at the end years as well. At the end of the day, would, would would you change what's not broken? If you've got something that's growing, it's improving. You're getting more fans. The, the last thing they need to do is say, right, we're going to move it to York, we're going to move it to Doncaster, we're going to take it on the road. I think with Super League, it's a bit different with their Magic Weekend version because. With the Magic Weekend, you know that wherever you go, you're likely to get big crowds. I know I was talking to a friend about the, the attendance coming up for, for this weekend at Anfield. Mm -hmm. And I was saying it wouldn't surprise me if the attendance at the event in Newcastle last year, whether that, that proves to be bigger over the course of the weekend than Anfield. But that, that's something we can probably discuss next week when we've got all the figures. But yeah, in terms of the Summer Bash, I think there's no point in changing it. And I think that the challenge now is for next year to get what seventeen, eighteen thousand. Just keep growing it year on year. That that's how good good events are made. It's not a case of saying right, let let's just move it and hopefully the crowds will flock because I don't think it'll be the case at all. Yeah, so sorry, Bradford and Witness, you're not going into Super League because the Championship and the Summer Bash need you both. <laughs> And Lee as well. We can't forget Lee. They had a, a fantastic following. Oh, it was a good, good turnout, wasn't it? I know my, uh, my my Twitter feed was was full of it on Sunday evening when I managed to get back to the hotel after um, Lancashire's game against Serbia. Yeah. And I sort of was doing the old catch-up and scrolling through. <laughs> um, right, Theo. Uh, so, we've done the Summer Bash. We've done League One. Let's move into Super League. Um, where shall we start with this? Shall I go through the results Let's again? Let's go through the results. Let's have a recap for all the audience. Okay, so there were wins for Huddersfield Giants, 30 points to 22 against Hull Kingston Rovers. Uh, a massive win for Cast Tigers, 30 points to 8. Spoiling Lee Drymore's big night of opening, <laughs> was it the North Stand this time? The North Stand, yep. Um, there was a great win for London Broncos, 42-34 against Wakefield Trinity, although again the tackle bags must have gone missing Crazy somewhere game. Anymore. Talking about crazy games, St Allen's getting a, a controversial score right at the end to defeat a a, a very good sort of performance mm. from the sounds of it, 32-30. to 30. Uh, And a surprise result for me, Hull Kingston Rovers 19, Warrington Wolves 12. Hull FC 19, do you mean, Dave? Did that, what did they say? Hull Kingston Rovers? Did that? We've got Hull, Hull Kingston Rovers Hull winning Kingston and Rovers. losing on the same weekend. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're <laughs> obviously very talented, that bunch of players. Sorry, sorry all you Hull fans, I'm going to get hate mail now. For we'll a have week. an influx of comments coming will, through. Will, yeah, Warrington Wolves 12, Hull FC 19. There we go. Um, and then the, uh, the big game in front of 70,000 empty seats. Uh, Castle well, Lands Dragons 33, <laughs> Wigan Warriors 16. There were a lot of good performances from that weekend. I think I want to I want to start with with the Saints game. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's been a lot made of was it a try, was it not a try. It's touching. I, personally, if I was the ref, I would have given a try. It pains me pains me to say it. There was a little bit of a bobble as he went down, but I don't think he ever loses control of that ball. I think he knocked on. That, that's, yeah. that was my that was my initial thought on that one. It's yeah. it's it's one of them as well where once the ref's gone off as try or no try. It, it's going to be given that way because there's not enough evidence for the video ref to disprove it. If, if he would have gone up as a no try, Salford would have won that game. It's simple as. Do you reckon the rulings will change for next season? You know, and we'll just get. Is there any reason why I can't? Do I hope. Try? I hope it doesn't. Personally, right. I I like it being try no try because at the end of the day, it's giving referees more responsibility. We, it's, okay. We've seen in recent years, it's so easy for a referee to to go up to the video ref, not give their opinion, just say. Can we check the pass, the offside, the obstruction, the touching goal, the grounding? Has he got a foot to it? He can go up and ask for absolutely everything on the play. And essentially, is, is that having an easy way out? By, by having the ref say, I think it's this, I think it's a try, I think it's a no try. It's given them a bit more power. Mm -hmm. And yeah, people might, people might disagree with that. But at the end of the day, we want referees are the people who are officiating our game. And they should give their opinion, their on-field version. Because at the end of the day... Uh, the TV cameras and the, the video referee is not at every game, is it? So, at games where there's no video referee, the referee would still have to use his instinct. He still has to do the same process he's doing now. So, I, 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 want, I want to keep trial no try. So, even though they don't, they don't get everything right, and the video ref obviously didn't have enough 
evidence to disprove that. I, I do think it's a good system we've got in place. It sounds like another spectacular performance from Lachlan Cootie in that one as well. It does show us it's three tries, two assists, a place in our Super League Team of the Week on site. He's you might as well just give him a regular spot in the Super League Team of the Week because he's been he's been box office, hasn't he? He's really? been absolutely for, fantastic. For St. Helens. And I, I think he's far more of a team player than Ben Barber was. I've been yeah. having this conversation, you know, because Ben Barber was a very good individual player, very, very sparky. Yeah. Um, Lachlan Coote is like, just like Mr. Cool, though, isn't it? Yeah. At the end of the day, you, you look at Ben Barber, he was a flair player and he's absolutely fantastic. But then the, you, you wonder, especially the feeling amongst the fan base, is how are you going to replace Barber when he goes? And Lachlan Coote came in. <clears throat> there was a lot of excitement about that. And I think he'd be... Re- I'd even go out on the limb. I think Lachlan Coote has been better than Ben Barber was in Super League. I agree. I in agree. terms of, in, not in terms don't, of having, don't don't shot yourself. Yeah, not, I've agreed with you. Not I oh, know it's not very often, <laughs> but it's, yeah, I think Lachlan Coote in terms of what he does for the team is far more than Ben Barber ever did. Ben Barber was he he got a lot of the headlines because he got the tries, he got the assists, but Lachlan Coote he he makes that he makes it tick. I think he he makes Saints move forward. They keep on going. He's Mister Mister Reliable. Mm-hmm. He doesn't seem to have a bad performance. There's a, a few guys in Super League. Him, David Fafita, those kind of guys who never put a foot wrong. So yeah, it's a. Uh, I think I think Lachlan Coote's been absolutely sensational. And even though it's a, it's bit, what halfway through the season, I think a Super League dream team spot should be incoming for him. Okay. Um, what what a win that was for for Huddersfield. Yeah, it was a. It seemed a bit a crazy game. They they were behind, I think, at one point. I think sixteen eight at half time. To come back and get the win was brilliant. And the the, the thing for Huddersfield is, <clears throat> can they can they keep the momentum going? They've got. They, they seem to pick off good wins, but then it's never never backed up week after week after week. Which it's a consistency issue, really, yeah, isn't it? Which is obviously something they'll be working on. And going in going into the magic weekend against Hull FC, who will undoubtedly be spurred on. That that'll be a really interesting one. Both sides will be full of confidence. I think that that could possibly be the game of the weekend uh, at, at Anfield. But yeah, Huddersfield are, they're on the right track. They've got some good players. They've got the likes of Alex Meller, who's been mm-hmm. absolutely superb this year. He looks like he could be moving on, doesn't he, at the end of the season? Because he's not agreed a new contract with them yet. Yeah, well, if 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 he thinks he can get money elsewhere, then why why shouldn't he have a look around? And you, you look at Super League clubs who are possibly higher up in the league who. We'll be looking at bringing new players in, and he's a good he's a good player. He, he doesn't seem to put a foot wrong really. He's very reliable. He, he reminds me a little bit of Jack Hughes at Warrington in terms of he, he's he's a great player week in week out. Sometimes he doesn't grab the headlines. Occasionally, as we saw a few weeks ago, he'll get a hat trick and man the match and whatnot and man of steel points. But he's more a grafter, isn't it? He? he is. Yeah, that, that seems to be my word of the week and description of the week, doesn't it? Grafter. We've had a couple of Cumbrian grafters. Yeah. Mel is a bit of a grafter. Any more grafters we want to pay a <laughs> tribute to here, James? That could be a new feature: grafter of the week. Grafter of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if that came up. But yeah, uh, I think yeah, Mella, Mella's a good player, and I I can see him joining the top four team. He might yeah, not start yeah. week in week out, but someone like a Wigan perhaps. I think he, I think he could fit in well there if, if Wigan came calling for him. Oh, interesting! Yeah, interesting. Right, okay. See, watch this space. Um, any other of those those games? I mean, I suppose where do we always start with Leeds? Because I mean, we just seem to be talking. It's getting wor- <laughs> wor- worse week after week at Leeds, and I can't even say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been. It, you just wonder what's going to happen next for Leeds. Of the, the, I think it's it's fair to say now they are well and truly in a relegation fight. We've had, we've had, I think, Brian Noble this week coming out and saying that losing Leeds in Super League would be bad for the competition as a whole. But no, it wouldn't. They're, they're a decorated side. The hey, what a side it would be in Championship, though. Oh, imagine Conrad Horrell turning out at Barrow them Raiders. And, so. them, and, them and Bradford together in Championship. Whoa. That'd be crazy, wouldn't it? But, yeah. I, I, and I bet, I bet Brian Noble wouldn't be crying in his milk if uh, Leeds get relegated into Toronto or get promoted. Yeah, exactly. it? I think it's a little bit of a little bit of arrogance from from Brian Noble towards the big clubs. Oh, you reckon? Yeah, I think. So, well, oh, it's your turn to be a controversial. I'm liking this. You're getting your opportunity. I am. Well, we, as you said, he won't he won't be disappointed if if Toronto take their place. And yes, he's, he's pointed out the history that they've got. But at the end of the day. Their squad this year isn't anywhere near good enough to what it has been in the past. They've got, we've, we've, we could talk about Leeds for two, three hours, just about all the problems they've got in their Square side. Square pegged round holes comes to mind. Exactly. Describing that. And, uh, 
again, I noticed a lot of criticism for the likes of Lola Hay. Yeah. He just isn't living up to his name, is he? It's a weird one with Lola Hay because undoubtedly he's, he's a fantastic player in the half, but he's just not got the player next to him who can orchestrate. It was said about how much Leeds need a six, and he's he's given that role, but that's not where he wants to play. You look at years gone by, you've had Danny Maguire, who it's, it's been tipped that he he got asked by Leeds to, to go back until the end of the season. I, I want to ask you about this as well, because Maguire has apparently accepted a role uh, at Hull Kingston Rovers once he's playing contracts done at the end of the year, to become head of recruitment. What on earth is head of recruitment? Oh, Does this mean he should be the guy that gets fired if Hull Kingston Rovers get relegated yeah. next year? That, 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 that sounds like it should be the case. It's a weird role to have. And head of recruitment, they make it sound like football clubs. Who is, it? <laughs> is it Chelsea who's got a first team coach and a... Uh, a guy that does all the wheelings and dealings. Oh yeah, it's, it's it is turning more into football by the week, isn't it? The fact that you've got all these different roles. But do you reckon they've been on there like championship now football manager? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll have that role. That sounds like a good title for somebody. <laughs> That's how it's gonna go now. You, you never know. You never know what's going on. But go go back to go back to Maguire a little bit. You you wonder you wonder how how desperate Leeds must be not not taking anything away from Maguire fantastic player but the fact that Leeds are having to bite the bullet a little bit and sacrifice a little bit of pride in, in going back to someone who they let leave it's, it's, it's a weird situation you look at Leeds' halfbacks we've said time and time again McClellan Myler Lollahea Sutcliffe if he plays there none of them are an out and out number six mm-hmm. which is something that it, 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 it it's infuriating and I think you wonder what, what Leeds are going to do because inevitably they'll need to bring a six in if they want to survive because this weekend is going to be absolutely massive. When they take on London at the Magic Weekend, London will know that if they can win, then they they are really got a good chance of staying up in the division, which will be absolutely fantastic if they manage to do it. I'm guessing when the Magic Weekend fixtures were released, everybody thought, but Leeds against London? Yeah. What a turgid, horrible... Terrible game that'll be, but uh, it, it's ending up probably being the most pivotal one of the weekend. Well, isn't it? well, I'm going. I'm going to Anfield for the full weekend, and out of all the games to watch, I think that's that's the one that I'm really looking forward to, just because I know that there's a, such a big chance of getting an upset there, especially with with London coming in off the back of a win against Wakefield. I, I hope you can stand up. You get the chance to stand up between games because I believe there's not much room between the seats. Oh, Anfield! Anfield's a nightmare for a. Sitting down, someone who's over six foot, it's never, it's never good sitting down in there. See, yeah, I suppose it's not bad for me at like five foot nine. <laughs> it is. You know, I can, I can always like sit on my knees. It's all right for some, isn't it? Yeah, but yeah. But yeah I, I, What's weather like up there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, out, out of all the games at the weekend, I think that that's the one personally I'm looking forward to. I don't know what your thoughts are and what what your game of the weekend is. Um, I'll have a look at the fixtures and tell you in a bit. Yeah, there we go. So what's See, how, space? how do you keep an idiot in suspense? I'll tell you next week. <laughs> um, no, no. Um, right. Um, anybody else who have not mentioned? Because I want, I do want to come to this Barcelona fast. Yeah. <laughs> we've got Warrington, who, Warrington, Hull FC, which we've not really touched on a great. That week. shot me. That result. Yeah, it's, it was it was a crazy result and. Again. Considering like Warrington knocked him for sixty points in a corresponding fixture about yeah. what ten weeks ago, were they? it was and it's 60, 63 points to twelve when they met last. And uh, it, one thing that was was quite interesting that came out of Lee Radford's post match conference was he was talking a lot about the Warrington social media game. We've spoken a lot about it being brilliant in in terms of getting people to the game. He was very critical of it. He was he was saying that it's it gave them extra motivation he called it distasteful i think was one of the words he called it i think he called it arrogant so he's obviously got got very different views to how warrington are feeling in terms of marketing and he he, he said that that spurred hull on a little bit so so he didn't really need to do a team talk because didn't. warrington did it for him on social that's, media that's exactly what it was because he, he he specifically mentioned a lot of a lot of the tries from previous meetings warrington turning hull over yeah. on many an occasion in recent recent months, recent years. I mean, you have got to watch, and I think that clubs do have an obligation. I understand that you want to build the game up and you want people talking about it, but you've got to watch that it's all done in the right taste and the right well, sort of pitch. I think, I think it, it's done in the right... I think if you want to grow rivalries, which is something that Super League needs to do a yeah. bit more, because you look at other sports, the rival rivalries are far more intense in 
other other competitions across the world compared to Super League, ours is a little bit dampened down. To be fair, you don't want the rivalry that the two main football clubs in Belgrade have because oh um, uh, that that is just horrendous. We don't want <laughs> anything like that. But uh, what I'm what I'm saying is that you can still build that rivalry. But yeah. It doesn't need to be at the detriment and sort of like pushing towards it. So obviously they they put stuff out there. I, I haven't seen this stuff, so you may, you've yeah. maybe got a jump on me. Yeah. In, this, in, in sort of seeing it. In your opinion, then, it wasn't as bad as what no, Lee Radford is alluding to. At the it? end of the day, it's what they've done every week this season. Mm -hmm. And Warrington are doing it to get bums on seats in the stadium. Mm -hmm. And looking at the crowd figures of this working? season. Or is it working for that? I mean, they had 10,600 yeah, the weekend. At they? the crowd so. figures they've had this season, especially for the bigger games when they've, they've built it up a lot, I think they've really turned it into a family, family occasion. And... I, I think what they're doing on social media is fantastic. I don't. I, I'll take my Warrington hat off for a little for a little minute. That's gone. <laughs> and I, I put, I, from an outsider, I think I don't. I don't know how we can criticize. Obviously, some of the stuff they do is a bit a bit close to the wind. It's obviously quite tongue in cheek. Some of it's really can be quite. I don't, I don't know what the correct word is. It's kind of spurs, as you said, spurs teams on and gives them that added motivation. But at the end of the day, Warrington are doing this to try and generate interest around games and that's what they're doing if, if, if other clubs choose to see it as a negative then that, that that's their decision uh, i suppose in one respect it is getting people talking about it isn't it and that's what you want in rugby league it's you, you've heard the phrase a lot all publicity is good publicity you wonder i mean we talk enough about it don't we we talk enough about the game is that, i think as well <laughs> the, the fact that we're talking specifically about warrants marketing is a tick in the box for them it's, it's showing that they're doing their job right getting people like us talking talking about what they're doing we've seen so many things this season we've seen the light show that they've had we've seen i think i don't know if you've seen there's been some stuff with the stewards like dance offs with wolfie which has been oh i saw that one which has been absolutely it's, it's been somewhat somewhat different they're thinking outside the box this year and that that's something that i think more clubs should do it, it was crazy for me when because I, I spoke to one of one of the guys behind the warrington marketing this year who has a lot to do with the social media and he he actually said that some clubs don't want to engage with them because they don't because that's not the way they do it and at the end of the day you've got to you've got to step outside the box if we're looking at growing the sport and we're looking at getting more fans into the stadium and getting them engaged you need to try something different and i find it ludicrous how, how some of the established clubs that we mentioned aren't willing to get involved and don't want to don't want to step out of the comfort zone so to speak we could always play dartboard rugby league and just grab a dart grab a, a world map and chuck it at it and say we'll have rugby league played there which uh, appears to have happened at the weekend when uh, oh. wigan and uh, catalan dragons have ended up in barcelona well I think um, we, so we, again we've got slight, we've got very different views on that so i'll let you come in from the real positive side and i'll i'll come at it from a slightly different angle yeah, I think I, I personally think it was, a, it was an absolutely fantastic day for, for rugby league as a whole. Even you, we've had a lot of people, as you'll probably go on to in a minute, talking about oh, there were a lot of empty seats and that that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, they broke the Super League record for a regular season game. The colour in and around Barcelona, you saw on the TV screens, you saw how many of the Catalonian people were, were getting behind the team. It, it was it was brilliant to watch. For Catalan to get the win as well was fantastic and. You, you, you've got to remember as well that Wigan played their part in making such a great occasion by taking, what's it, 5,000 fans over there. Have they sold 5,000 tickets for Magic yet? But at the end of the day, I think <laughs> they, they, this, no, but this, this proves that going to Barcelona, going for these big games abroad, has got more of a pull factor than going for a rainy weekend in Liverpool. Hey, do you have it then? Magic weekend in Barcelona? You never know. We, we've seen stranger things happen, but at the, at the end of the day... Cup final in Barcelona! <laughs> No, I won't go that far, but I, I, I do think we could take a magic weekend on the road. I'm a huge advocate of that. If there's what one thing that I've, I've seen a lot recently is, eat, that's why I want to see what the, what the attendance figures are for Anfield this weekend because we've had Newcastle that had really good attendance figures last year. If Liverpool doesn't live up to that, then there's a case to say right, we've brought it closer to a lot of clubs as opposed to taking it up to Newcastle. Now we've brought it to Anfield and we've done worse tickets. With ticket sales if they say right we're going to take it to a barcelona we're going to take it abroad i think you'd still get thirty thousand people a day i think i think that i don't i don't want to go too far but it wouldn't surprise me if they took it abroad and they got the highest ever weekend attendance for a magic weekend because we've seen with wigan their fans have gone abroad because it's the occasion it's the weekend a lot of them have spent all week there and enjoying it all the players have been out and about meeting them and you you think what 
what would happen if all teams did that? Because when, when teams go over to Perpignan, a lot of clubs have good followings. If, if they did a Magic Weekend at Barcelona, or even if they did it at another ground in Spain, it, I think it would be a real success because you'd get thousands of fans personally that would go over and go and enjoy the full weekend. I know one thing that you probably talk about a bit more in a minute is to do with the legacy that it leaves in Barcelona. We've seen Catalan and Barcelona have, have such a, not rapport, but it, they've got such an identity because it's to do with the Catalan region and all the independence and whatnot. And you wonder what happens in the long run. I, I personally would like to see Catalan take one game to Barcelona's new camp every year, if that's something that could work. But I don't think it'd be Wigan every time. If they took one game every year and took a different team every year, I think that would only boost the game. And if Rugby League went back to the new camp, I think you'd get fans who'd say, oh, well, or Spanish fans who'd say, right, we went last time, it was a really good day out, let's go, let's take some family. And that's how you grow it in new regions. And that's something that Catalan have wanted to do. I'll first of all start with positives, yep. because there was. I think that the French Rugby League uh, didn't have any yeah, or very all. few games that took place over the weekend. So it gave a lot of people in that south of France the chance to go and experience this game, which I think is fantastic. There's a lot of joined up thinking there, obviously, that's gone behind that. Uh, I am behind spreading the word of Rugby League. Obviously, I've been out to Serbia. You know, so you can't you can't go to places like that in Fiji and not be all for spreading the game. I ask, has any money been made out of it? And who's got who's got that money? Does that go back to Catalans or does that go to Barcelona? In which case rugby league isn't seeing any of the money. Yeah. Um you, okay, you've raised you've you've raised the bar and you've got so many Catalans people in there, you've got so many people from Barcelona in the stadium. But I question, as James put it, the legacy that it leaves. Because we, we have just done this before, where we've, we've gone and took it. And, and Rugby League's been like this big circus that rolls into town, <laughs> puts on a big show, people seem to love it, and then we don't do anything with it. Yeah. This has happened so many times over Rugby League history. You know, we tried to take the game down to Devon, for example. I know that's not quite as exotic as you know, <laughs> going to Belgrade and going to, <laughs> to Barcelona and going to Fiji and the like. But we've, we've took it that we, we, we had like the round on the road, I remember, uh, in the early few years of Super League, yeah. where they went up and played things like Tyne Castle and various other, other places. Um, and there was no legacy left. And... I know that people think maybe, or certain people, or maybe certain people that are involved here at Love Rugby League think that I'm a Rugby League mm-hmm. dinosaur with the way that I was thinking. I know James <laughs> saw it in front of his, uh, his camera last week and said, um, why do we have to have a legacy? Yeah. And why can't we just enjoy it as a thing? But it's about growing Rugby League when all's said and done. And the idea would be, as I'd said nothing, if yeah. the plan was, right, we want a Barcelona team in, or we want a, another team in the region that is going to play, and it's going to play a part in the future of rugby league. See, I'd, I'd partially disagree with that in terms of getting a Barcelona team, because with Catalan, you have a team that already has a close affiliation and a close identity to the city. And going back to what you said about money as well, I think an occasion like this, even though money's important, it's more than about money, because if they... If, if they can get even a few hundred people from Barcelona, from the Catalonia region, interested in the sport, that, that's the job done for them. It's, it's but not... where did they go? Did they go to Perpignan then? Because well, I mean, we're talking somewhere which is across a border, 190 kilometres away. But so It's whether, it, it, it is in a sense, but I think you, you, look at, you look at if you get more fans involved, they could, they could easily, maybe once or twice a season, go from Barcelona to Catalan. We've seen how the Catalan fans turned out in numbers and went over to the new camp. It shows what an affiliation they have with the city, with the culture, with the with the identity they have. So yeah, it's 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 interesting to see what happens. The legacy is the most important thing, but in terms of, I don't think they need a, a Barcelona team. It's just where it goes from here. And I think Catalan need to see if there's any possibility of taking a game to the new camp once a year. Because I, I I'd say less because they tried this before. They took yeah. one game. They played Warrington over in Barcelona. I think it was at the Olympic Stadium. Olympic Stadium. Yeah. That was ten years ago. 
And then, so we've had nothing for 10 years and suddenly, way it's gone to Barcelona. Well, Everybody's up here. Well, it's, it's, this is fantastic for rugby league. But it's a short term. It's like watching the circus come in. Oh, look, the big top's in town. <laughs> Let's go and... Oh, it's, it's curious. I've, I've never seen these bearded women before. <laughs> well, <that's, laughs> it's like that though, isn't it? Well, it's a cur- there's a curiosity well, that, about that's it. That's where I'd, I'd agree with you in the sense of the fact that it's, it has been such a long time since they've taken the game to Barcelona. The, the thing now is to really imprint it in the minds of the people and you can only do that by playing it once a season. It's no good doing, oh, we'll play in Barcelona in 2019, oh, we'll come back in 2022, 20, 2020 we're going to Berlin and then 2021 we're going to Rome. It's yeah, like, it needs to be, don't, that, don't, don't, don't go talk about that. That was like my journey back to England yeah. that, from <laughs> Belgrade. <laughs> but yeah, I think you, that that's what needs to happen. It needs to be done once a season if they're going to grow. It's no, it's no good them saying, oh, we've got a great idea, let's play it once and then we'll come back in 10 years' time because then, all the fans are forgotten, fans won't care. At the end of the day, that's not how you organically grow something. So they need they need that legacy. And if, if they're not going to do a legacy, then then I will be opposing the game at the new camp. The fact that they've just done it for the one off occasion, I do think there needs to be some kind of structure and plan in place to grow it. We, we do agree on that. We do. we do. We do agree on that. And that's ultimately where we want to see rugby league grow. What, what about. What about you? What do you think? I mean, I know David said he's been quiet because he's been under his tractor, which I'm a bit worried about. I hope you've been, I hope you've sorted it, whatever it is. Uh, Maureen reckons that the sound is never quite loud enough, but um, you know, we, I don't, I'm not sure whether we can get closer because otherwise, uh, extreme close-ups will shut me out for starters. So I don't think everybody wants to see that. You should see your sunburn, Dave. Uh, yeah, me sunburn. Yeah, me sun marks. Got a burnt, burnt nose again. It's always the biggest part, though. Isn't it? <laughs> so, always gets the sun. All that, all that Serbian sun that's been there. Uh... Yeah, I just wanted to, to just reflect on Serbia because mm. it, was a, it was a great tour. Lancashire played two matches over there. We played a game against Red Star Belgrade, who fielded uh, fifteen Serbians, two Australians. Mm. They had an Australian halfback and an Australian second row. Well, they've got a couple of Australian guys behind the scenes. Uh, Colin Clay went there. Yeah, I met, I met Colin. Colin. Great bloke. Great bloke, he, he sort of shoulders round and um, I, I had a really good chat with him. They've also got a couple of Papua New Guinea players that are oh, wow. going to be starting playing for them, yeah. Um, so they, they were great hosts, by the way. Uh, we got a chance to see the Red Star Belgrade Football Stadium, I think, mm-hmm. is it the Maracana? Right? Yeah. Um, which is a, a fantastic place, even though if you've got the lowest tier, you can't see the goal. <laughs> So you'd be really but disappointed, but to be honest, those seats are only like four hundred dinar, which is about two pound fifty. You can't so, complain about that, could you? Um, so they they were fantastic hosts. So we enjoyed playing against those Serbian boys. Some some real promising rugby league players, to be honest. Uh, they've got an Australian coach. He was telling us afterwards that the the growing confidence game on game, and they need the challenges of playing against lads that have played rugby league all the lives. Yeah. Um, then on Sunday we played a Serbian select side, All right. which were great for about 10 or 15 minutes. They were really good, very strong, and then I think, because uh, they had a lot of players who, with all due respect, looked more like rugby union players. Mm. Uh, so they weren't used to going the 10 metres back with the defence and, and advancing and everything yeah. like that. So they soon got fatigued, so it went from being 10 points to 6 after... Uh, 10 minutes yeah. to be in 20 points to 6 after 20 and the game was gone then really mm. um, but even so they kept on plugging away there was this number 19 real tough boat of a player <laughs> every time he ran the ball in he got bounced absolutely battered you know so there'd be two players ooh, boom, straight down on his back you'd think he would have got up and lost his temper but no every time he gets up big beaming smile on his face plays the ball <laughs> pats the guy on the back and tells him it was a good tackle and um, uh, but no, they were they were good hosts. Um, it's a fantastic part of the world if you ever get the chance to go to uh, Belgrade. Very interesting city. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've got to thank the Lancashire committee mm. uh, for giving me the opportunity to join them. But mm. yeah, so uh, two two nil on the road. Very good. A good experience, and we made some friends as well. So exactly. that's always good. You never know. In a few months' time, the the budget might stretch for Liverpool Weekly in Belgrade. Eh, eh? Well, you never know. one in Barcelona. I did actually think of going live myself, but it, it would have coincided with when the guys were on, and I didn't want to sort of interfere it's with two rival broadcasts at the waffling same time. on about <laughs> Super League. You see, so right. Okay, with that done and dusted, let's have a look at this weekend's uh, fixtures. So, uh, we do, of course, have the big magic weekend at Anfield. St. Helens topping the table for ticket sales as it stands at the moment. 3,750 as of yesterday. Mm. 
She's a bit disappointed. No, but then at the end of the day, they'll, they'll be, A, there'll be thousands of fans who'll buy them on the day, I reckon, because they'll, they'll know that they'll be able to get tickets. Some of them might be looking out to see what the weather is. I don't, I don't know what the mindset of some people is. And also, there'll be a lot of fans who'll buy them through the RFL website as well. My, myself, that's what, that's what I did. I bought through there. And I don't think there is really a way of showing what team you're from there, because mm -hmm. obviously you could get them in the unreserved stands, then there's no way of knowing. But I think oh, is that I, what they've done? Have they got like an unreserved yeah. stand and reserved sort of two ends or something? Yeah, they've got they've got some unreserved sections, some reserved sections for certain teams. But yeah, I think I I, I don't think the crowd will be as bad as a lot of people are making out. I, I do still think they'll they'll get thirty thousand, but we'll just have to wait and see what transpires. Uh, you, you know what you needed then? You need hashtag positive rugby league on the front <laughs> of that statement. But uh, uh, right, get, get the t shirt for next week. <laughs> hashtag positive rugby league. <laughs> Hashtag positive, love rugby league. There you go, that, that's the different one, isn't it, for us. Uh, so, the fixtures this coming Saturday, as far as that's concerned. Catalans Dragons against Wakefield Trinity. Huddersfield Giants against Hull. Warrington against Wigan for the 20 zillionth try time in the last five years. Oh, I'm sick of seeing that game. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, there's, they play them so many times. One, one thing that's crazy as well, Warrington and Hull KR as well, because obviously they've drawn each other in the cup. Mm. Warrington now have to go to Hull KR away three times this season. Really? Because they have to go to the... Oh, did they get them in a loop fixture? They got well? them away in the loop fixture and away in the cup. So that's going to be a... No one wants to make three trips, especially if they're all Friday night <laughs> games. No one wants to do three trips over to a Humber side with, with peak rush hour traffic. Uh, can I just say, I love Hull. I've got some good <laughs> friends in Hull. It's not so bad as it's not as bad as he's saying. Yeah, the traffic Honest. the traffic's just crap. <laughs> <laughs> Do uh, some good food at Hull KIV, alright. <laughs> Sunday sees Hull Kingston Rovers against uh, Salford, Leeds Rhinos against London Broncos, mm -hmm. and Castleford Tigers against St Helens. So it's going to be some interesting games. I'll just give you a quick run through of who I think will win each of those games. Okay. I think Wakefield will beat Catalan, Hull FC will beat Huddersfield. I'm tipping Warrington to beat Wigan, although that'll be close. I think Salford will beat Hull KR. I think London will beat Leeds, Ooh. which will be which will be the bit. Oh, it's like Panther, aren't it? <laughs> I think that'll be. Ready? The... I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll be the big game of the weekend, and then I can't see past Saints beating Castleford. But I'm looking forward to a big weekend of rugby league. We've seen now how successful and how how entertaining the summer bash was. It's now Magic Weekend's got a lot to live up to. Uh, so that's the Betfred Magic Weekend in Super League. Uh, Betfred Championship, that all starts on Friday night. Sheffield Eagles against Toronto. Then on Saturday, Toulouse Olympique host Lee Centurions. Massive game. So it is a big game, that one. <laughs> Betfred Championship on Sunday sees Barrow host Rochdale Harnix. That's a massive game as well, mm. for different reasons. <laughs> uh, Batley Bulldogs at home to Halifax. Featherston Rovers at home to Bradford Bulls. Featherston have gone so close to beating Bradford this season. They've surely got to do it this next time. There's been a point between them in like two encounters. So it, it, it'd be it'd be typical of a uh, Dane Chisholm comes back to haunt the balls. We see we saw Jordan Lilly do it against Leeds. It'd be it'd be almost poetic if Dane Chisholm has another inspirational performance like he did at the summer bash. It's another one of those rugby league intricacies, isn't it? Yeah, like thinking it could happen. <laughs> Swinton at home to Dewsbury Rams. Widnes Vikings at home to York City Knights. Uh, a full programme of Betfred League One action as well. Sees Keithley at home to Oldham on uh, Saturday. Whitehaven against London Scholars, like we were talking about before, which mm. I think is the real pick of those fixtures. Sunday, Coventry Bears against North Wales Crusaders. That's not going to be a picnic for North Wales Crusaders. Mm. Uh, Doncaster taking on West Wales Raiders. Newcastle Thunder taking on Hunslet. We've got a, a bit of a, a mixed... Um, fixture list as far as the amateur scene is concerned as well so just a few games to tell you about um one's already taken place normanton knights against featherston lions that was on tuesday night this coming saturday in the premier division rochdale mayfield at home to thato heath crusaders big game there Wathbury hornets are home to thornhill trojans west hall against siddle division two sees barrow island against bradford dudley hill we can set dudes against west bowling division three sees hunslet warriors beat eastmore dragons Wollstone Rovers against Driglington. Uh, just to give you a quick update, top of the Premier Division is West Hull. Mm -hmm. Division 1 sees Pilkington Rex, despite losing the other week, um, still top of the pile there. Division 2 in Troy's Bridge at the top. Division 3, Dewsbury Celtic at top. Oh. So, um, 
just one other thing to tell you about getting our lead tonight yours truly hosting um, okay. it's the Castleford Tigers ladies up against Featherstone Lions ladies I believe there's a bit of history between these two clubs should be worth a watch 7 o'clock via the Our League app also on the Rugby League website and via Twitch as well Any, it? anything with you commentating is going to be good day so I would recommend that everyone tunes in well, if I didn't even have to pay you for that <laughs> I'm not, I'm done. What's, what's your fees we've never discussed these fees <laughs> We've never discussed these things. That could be an, a, a that could be for off camera, yeah. That could be arranged, okay. All right. Uh, anything final from yourself, James? Uh, no. One one thing, looking ahead to the Magic Weekend we've got, we've got a lot of uh, exciting content coming on site. We've got all the team news. We've got a lot of a lot of pieces. We had Drew and James over at Anfield at the start of the week. As soon as he flew back from Barcelona, they were straight over there. I think loads of content. I just want to ask whether they're going to come in next week and say, like, either Manuel from... Uh, from <laughs> Faulty Towers, <laughs> or whether they're going to sound like the Scousers from Harry Enfield. Oh my gosh, you'll have, <laughs> you'll, have, uh, you'll have James coming in with a slight Spanish accent and Drew with his slight American Can you imagine Drew going, hey, hey, Dave, calm down, calm down. <laughs> oh. yeah. I don't think Drew can s- stray away from Wigan. Wigan. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for joining us. As usual, we appreciated all your comments, but that's all done and dusted. Do keep tuned to Love Rugby League and in association with our supporters, Betfred. This is your signing off from Love Rugby League Weekly.